Now, Sports Talk with Broads. Here's Hunter Brody. What is going on, everyone? Welcome on into Sports Talk with Broads Championship Sunday. Is there anything better than Championship Sunday? Some would argue that it's better than the Super Bowl. Now, I get the point. It's not better than the Super Bowl. So I guess my question to start this, is there anything better than Championship Sunday, is a stupid fucking question. And shame on me. Anyway, we had exciting football. For sure. No doubt about it. And we'll start off with Tom Brady versus Aaron Rodgers. Now, heading into the game, I didn't know how to emotionally feel because I wanted one of the two to win the Super Bowl. I was really pulling for Tom Brady because at heart, it's Tom Brady. And I want to see him dominate, and I want to see him win six more Super Bowls because he's that damn good. Even though he's throwing three interceptions, and it's not Tom Brady in his purest form, still finds a way. You know, I don't care how it gets done. I just care that it gets done. And Tom Brady finished the job. It's ridiculous. It really is. And we'll obviously get into what the hell happened here. But I'm just talking right now about my emotions heading into the game and who I was pulling for. Because at the other side, you have Aaron Rodgers. The guy has won only one Super Bowl, but he's been one of the best ever. And oh, by the way, he finally gets a chance to play an NFC Championship game at home in Green Bay. That's meaningful. That's powerful. Fans were in the stands. And he came up short. I'm a huge Aaron Rodgers fan. Even though there were a ton of missed penalties, let's say, by the referees, and it wasn't their strongest performance, how many chances did the Green Bay Packers have? How many plays did they leave out on the field? How many times did they screw up? Mental lapses and just not executing. Too many damn times. And the coach... Yeah, the coach made a piss-poor decision late in the game to kick a field goal, even though there was three timeouts left on the board for Green Bay and the two-minute warning. And I know the philosophy he tries to sell people. You had Tom Brady throw three interceptions, so you had the Green Bay defense being able to get stops, if you will. So make it a five-point game and then get Aaron Rodgers the football back. Like, I understand the mindset, but then it's too deep in the game. 2.05 left. I think that's a brutal mentality. I understand what he's trying to sell you. But then in there, you have Aaron Rodgers, one of the best to ever do it, with the football in his hands. Now, he said that he had, they had three attempts and they barely moved the football any yards. They didn't move the football. So that went into his decision-making as well. You got to give him a fighter's chance. He took the ball out of Aaron Rodgers' hands. It's just unacceptable. Now, there was a play where Aaron Rodgers rolled to the right, tried to force it across his body just a little bit to Devontae Adams in double coverage where there was a lane all the way to the end zone. When you look at the screenshots on Twitter, it'll make it look like it, it was a no-brainer, absolute 100% touchdown. Now, I don't know if it would have played out that way, but there's no doubt that Aaron Rodgers should have ran and it would have got them closer, especially if it was a four-down territory. You you would have you know definitely went for it in that spot if you were maybe two yards from the goal line and Instead of where they were, Aaron should have ran with it. That's a mistake on his part, and he did not look smooth. The Green Bay Packers did not look smooth. You have Aaron Jones getting cracked. There's a fumble there. Aaron Rodgers threw an interception. So, look, I mean, to make it seem like it's only 100% on the referees for making bad calls and not being consistent or letting them play all game and then during the final moments calling a, a pass interference play when you're tugging a jersey, there were so many plays left out there on the field where I couldn't do that. You know, I, I just personally can't do that. And I acknowledge it wasn't a strong performance by the Zebras. But still, Kings getting abused out there. You allowed the touchdown to occur due to a mental problem defensively. Not being on the same page defensively right at the end of the half. That can't happen, right? How about actually putting points up on the board when Tom Brady's chucking it up to Mike Evans on the right side of the field after getting some pressure and the running back couldn't pick it up? What happens then? You got to 
be able to handle the moments. And I don't think the Green Bay Packers did a good job with it at all. By the way, we are broadcasting live by the Manscaped Man Cave. In the Manscaped Man Cave, I should say. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code BROD at manscaped.com. Todd Bowles, he put on a clinic. He really did. I mean, he looked like a mastermind out there with what JPP was doing and what Shaq was doing, just getting to Aaron Rodgers and making him feel uncomfortable. They were getting the pressure. That's stellar. Oh, man, that's stellar. I think that that, that Bucks defense is going to obviously have to come up crucial against Pat Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs in the Super Bowl in a couple of weeks. That's going to be the test. That's going to be the matchup I'm really looking for. And not to look too far ahead here, but Fisher went down against Kansas City. So you got an O-lineman banged up with an Achilles injury while you're going up against what's going to have to hold Tampa Bay in the game. Because if you date back to last week in the divisional round, you know it wasn't as if Tom Brady was just picking people apart left and right. Their defense was insanity. Their defense was was one of the reasons why, the biggest reasons why, they came out with that outcome. Now, that's not to discredit Tom Brady, because I know some are. How about on the first drive, where they were connecting on third downs? Every third down, boom, boom, boom. Let's get into the end zone. Let's produce. Let's score early. So let's not act as if that doesn't matter just because it happened throughout the first drive of the game. How about just great plays from Godwin? You know, whether it's a missed drop here, okay, well, how about a bomb downfield that should have been intercepted? He's juggling it up and catching it. But that's Tom Brady putting his wide receiver in a position to succeed. Hey, go make this play. I see a matchup I like. Go make this play. Not only that, you have just great plays like a screen, and it, and it worked out perfectly. I know this might sound silly. Bro, it's a screen pass you're all excited for. Yeah, well, guess what? It was about the execution, the timing, and how it all played out just perfectly. It was a timed-out fake screen to the left, and then you turn around, fake it to Gronk, who takes it downfield. I mean, it's just like these little plays that are just fantastic, and it's like when they needed it, boom, it just sort of figured it out. It just sort of played out the way that the Bucks needed it to. This Bruce Arians and Tom Brady dynamic is really interesting to me because I thought that there were plenty of times early on where they were butting heads and it was somewhat public. You could see it in press conferences and all, like one guy saying one thing, the other guy's kind of going in another direction, but somehow, some way, they pull it together when needed. And I think you, you really got to tip your cap to Bruce Arians for adapting, right? Who you are as a coach, and then you acquire Tom Brady. I don't think it's the same as if you're coaching Lamar Jackson, if you're coaching Josh Allen, if you're coaching anybody else. You sort of have to give him a leash to to operate the way that he wants to, where he's out there pretty much taking care of business himself. All right, what are we going to do here? You had Leonard Fournette making plays, a nice spinorama touchdown, really nice run. Between him and Jones having a nice dynamic duo. Incredible. Incredible that they're here. Because all season long, you watch them play, and it didn't look like a Super Bowl team. It looked like a team that was going to make the playoffs and maybe win a game or so. And it looked like a Super Bowl team. And realistically, if you told me that during this run, you'd have Tom Brady throwing interceptions and being a tad off at times, uh, you really would think they have no shot. You would think that you would have to rely on Tom Brady to get the ball to Mike Evans, to get the ball to these guys, Godwin. Let them make plays, Gronk. But it's the defense right now that's holding them in. I can't believe LaFleur did this. 31 to 23. And he elects to make it a five point game. It's a one possession game. 204 left, three timeouts. I don't think that's enough to convince me to take the ball out of Aaron Rodgers' hands right there in that moment. And then after the game, you hear Aaron Rodgers say he's a little bit uncertain and he looked defeated. And he was saying, look, it wasn't my decision. It wasn't my decision. 
It wasn't my decision. You could tell that he was furious, as he should be. And then LaFleur, I wanted to hear his attitude. I wanted to hear the way he would approach things. And I just wanted to hear his tone of voice, see his body language. And he was asked if he regretted it. And he said, of course I regret it. Every time something doesn't work out, I regret it. You always think about the alternative. But then he somewhat backed up his reasoning with, well, you had four stoppages and you made it that five-point game. So if you were able to get the ball back. And I know some are complaining about the holding call that allowed the... Uh, Buccaneers to continue offensively. You saw the jersey, right? And I know what you're going to say. Earlier in the game, the same thing happened on the other side, and the Buccaneers scored at halftime. I know, I know. It it wasn't consistent, and it wasn't great, and it wasn't the smoothest. It would be different, though, if I didn't think Aaron Rodgers came up small. I thought Aaron Rodgers came up small. The third quarter, they made a couple pushback plays, and, you know, they they pushed back a bit, sure. But I still thought Aaron Rodgers came up small. And if he came up big, I don't think you talk about these calls the same way. You would bitch about them, but you would have won, and you would have thought, wow, you know, not only did Aaron Rodgers beat the Buccaneers, but they beat the officials too. Because with how putrid it was, and how, I'm not going to say lopsided, but inconsistent it was. Did Aaron Rodgers have plenty of times to go out there and deliver? Because I thought the answer to that is easy and simple. Yes. Yes, he did. Before we continue, I want to let you guys know about my friends over at DraftKings. Pigskin fans, the moment you have been waiting for all season is right around the corner. And DraftKings, the official daily fantasy partner of Super Bowl 55, is bringing back their golden ticket giveaway with up to $55 million in prizes up for grabs. All you have to do to get your share of these huge prizes is enter DraftKings free Super Bowl prediction challenge. Once you submit your picks, you will get a free instant prize up to $25,000. And if you have the most predictions correct, you can win the top prize of $1 million. Download the app now and enter the free prediction challenge. Answer questions like, who will score last? And boom, get ready to make it rain. Download the DraftKings app now and use promo code BRODES to enter the free $55 million Super Bowl prediction challenge. Everyone gets an instant prize up to $25,000 just for playing. So use promo code BRODES now and enter the free $55 million Super Bowl challenge only at DraftKings, the official daily fantasy partner of Super Bowl 55. Terms, conditions, and eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com for details. I know that there's knocks on taking field goals, right? That, that was like the knock all day long for both games. Oh, field goal this aggressive here, field goal this aggressive here. Now, the end where LaFleur kicked it, different scenario. And I guess this is a, a segue into what happened in Buffalo versus Kansas City because there were moments where Buffalo elected to, to go with the mentality of let's kick field goals right before half. Let's make it 21-12 to 12 instead of going for it because if we miss it, you know, it's <clears> – <throat> excuse me there. I've been screaming at the TV all day. If you miss it, well, then it's 21-9 to nine and you don't feel as good – going into half. Then, with about 20 minutes left in the game, so a handful of minutes left in the third quarter, 24-15, to 15, they made a field goal to kind of make it a 9-point game instead of a 12-point game, and people were confused because it's still a two-possession game, but I don't mind that, and I tweeted this out. When it comes to the Bills going up against the Chiefs, it is very easy to sit there and say the only way you beat the Chiefs is by outscoring them. You got to be aggressive. You got to put up points. And I'm not knocking that. I think that that's fair. And I would have been okay if they did that. If if um, uh, Sean McDermott, excuse me, I'm having brain farts now. Sean McDermott and Brian Dable, if they came up with this master plan of, look, we are just going to go for it, go for it, go for it, doesn't matter, let's just try and put points on the board, I would have understood that because, yes, you do, do need to score points to beat the Kansas City Chiefs. you got to throw haymakers in the ring. That's how you're going to have to get, get it accomplished. At the same time, though, I also think it's okay to say, don't chase points. If you have a chance against the Chiefs to put up any points at all, just keep putting points up until eventually one moment 
where you have to be more aggressive. So it was a nine-point game with 20 minutes left. I tweeted that out. I don't mind the Buffalo Bills kicking three there to make it nine. Just stay involved. Stay involved enough where you can make a counter punch at some point. Just stay hanging on by a thread. And then when you need to be aggressive, be aggressive. And and someone came back at me and said, are you stupid? It's a 20-minute game. There's 20 minutes left. And you're saying it, it's nine points. Like, what? Exactly. What am I missing here? I don't know how you could say that that's ridiculous. If the Buffalo Bills were told, hey, it'll be an eight, uh, excuse me, it'll be a 21 to 12 point game at half, would you take that? They probably would take that because they think they're in striking distance. With 20 minutes, that's a lot of minutes. For someone to look like, look at that and think that that's not a lot of minutes, that's crazy to me. 20 minutes left in a football game and it's only a nine point game. I'm taking that. If I feel confident about my team, I'm taking that if it's going up against the Kansas City Chiefs. That's not egregious. It could be a 25-point game knowing how powerful that Kansas City Chiefs team is. And that might seem like a loser mentality. Well, well, how can you be satisfied with being down? Well, let's look at the two teams and be realistic, all right? Even if the Buffalo Bills did go for it, they're still probably going to lose and get their asses kicked. Regardless of what they did, the Kansas City Chiefs are juggernaut. They're unbelievable. They're insanely lethal. So no matter what they did, if they went for it, if they didn't go for it, they were still going to lose. I don't mind the Bills basically saying, let's Put points on the board every chance we can, and let's see where that puts us. And it was putting them in nine-point games in situations where, you know what, if you gotta, if you gotta play it that way, play it that way. I don't mind it. I wouldn't mind if they went in the other direction either, but the outrage, especially on Twitter with all the head coaches on Twitter, and when I say head coaches, I'm talking about all of us and all the other people that really get into it on on the Twitter sphere. What would have happened if you went for it when you only had nine points? You don't get it. Oh, you should have kicked the field goal. Why are you chasing points at half? It's a better feeling when you go into the locker room after scoring points. How stupid can you be? You would have just played the other side. I think people were so fed up with what happened in the Green Bay game that it it was just snowballing into the second game where you had to go for it every time. Why do you have to go for it every time? It was not as egregious as people made it out to be for the Buffalo Bills. Now, it didn't end up working out, but I don't think even if they went for it, it would have worked out because, one, it doesn't mean they would have made it, and, two, it would have made it more of a blowout if they did it. Now, if they did make it and they did score those touchdowns, they're still losing anyway. So it is what it is. You know, look, the Buffalo Bills had a great season. They had a fun season, and they had a season that puts their organization on the trajectory. You shouldn't hang your heads at all. Did the did the Bills play great? No, they didn't. But I also think that's just because what the other side did to them. It, it was uncomfortable for Diggs. Diggs was one of their best weapons all season long. And when you have that secondary really closing in on him and making it a tough night, well, you're not going to be able to be as effective. And Cole Beasley, while he put up some numbers, you know he was nicked up. And, you know, as good as Cole Beasley is, he's not a guy that's going to game break like Diggs is. So if you take away Diggs, well, you're, you're not as impactful when it comes to stretching the field, and I think you saw that. Josh Allen had some moments. He turned the he turned the football over once, which considering what he once did in a playoff game and how all over the place he was, and he was holding on to the football with one hand, I'm talking about in his previous playoff games, it's a big difference when it comes to confidence and maturity and growth of the game. You just got to tip your cap to what happened there for the Bills this season, and they will be back. It's a tough loss, but it's one of those losses where, you know, you look at the other side and you go, okay, that's that's why we lost. We're going up against arguably maybe the next dynasty like we saw out of the New England Patriots with Andy Reid and Pat Mahomes there. I think you can make the argument that it's going to be a scary, scary ride. Pat Mahomes did not skip a beat. He was the lethal weapon you thought he would be. I wasn't really afraid of the head injury stuff because it kind of seemed it wasn't a brutal concussion. It was more of maybe a nerve or something that was hit. It was about the toe for me because when he's moving around in the pocket and running around and making plays, which, come on now, 
Unbelievable. Stopping on a dime. Defenders are going by him. Rowing to the right. Outworking defenders to row to the right. To sling it to Travis Kelsey. To sling it to Tyreek Hill. You name it. I mean, they are just special. Special, special, special players. And it all starts with Pat Mahomes. And really, it starts with Andy Reid and the enemy. We see all these beautiful red zone plays. But where's that coming from? It's an easy answer. Once again, it's Eric Bieniemy. Whether it's that shovel pass to Travis Kelsey in the middle, it's crazy what they're able to do. Or that lob throw where it's like they, he throws it 500 feet high, lobs it over everyone, and there's Travis Kelsey wide the hell open for an easy walk-in. It's crazy what they do. It's crazy how creative they are. And uh, look, I, I saw this screenshot on Twitter, even though I knocked the screenshot earlier with Aaron Rodgers rolling to the right. There's one play where it's with the Chiefs, and I don't even think it was for this game. I think it was a previous game, and it said, guess which way the ball is going. And you can see there's maybe four guys surrounding Pat Mahomes as he's going back and somewhat, it, it could have been a play action, or it could have been an actual handoff. The point is there's so many guys moving, and there's so much disguise going on that you have no clue. Pick a guy. And there's four options. I mean, seriously, pick a damn guy. You don't know where this ball is going. And that's how creative Andy Reid and Eric Bieniemy really are right now. And then you factor in having the best quarterback in the NFL. And you're going to have a really hard night defensively. Tyreek Hill finished with uh, how many yards? Where's, where's it at here? I, I know I write down. I do this all the time. He had 172 yards. While Travis Kelsey had 118. Ridiculous. And it didn't start out great for the Chiefs. Hardman muffs a punt. Well, the Bills get three on the board early. They kick a field goal and take a 3 nothing lead. And the Bills, real quick before I get to how it all played out, like the Bills offensively, it was clunky. Another reason why I think going for field goals isn't a problem to me. And some would say, well, if it's that clunky, how can you predict that you'll get back in those moments? You might have to execute there because you might not get back into the red zone or you might not get close to the end zone again. Why would you be satisfied with just three points if you know, hey, we're a little clunky, we're here, let's seize the opportunity. Well, I see it the other way. It's so clunky, it's not rolling perfectly, it's not crisp. I don't know if I want to take a chance at seven if I know I can get three. And that's that's not a bad mentality. I know some would say, well, that's soft. That's soft. How are you supposed to win if you have no balls? Well, there's plenty of games where teams do win because they accumulate a lot of points and they put them on the board and then eventually they hold themselves into it but little by little with those three points that they can pounce at the right time, be aggressive, and then win the game. That happens too. It's not as if the only way you ever win football games is just because you're aggressive. No, teams win when they do play a little bit laid back. Teams win when they do play a little bit soft. People just don't like that. And if you're the Bills, if your team isn't really playing with perfection and playing at their best rate, I think it's okay to just say, let's not chase points. Let's put as many points up on the board as we possibly can. Let's see where that puts us late in the third quarter, early in the fourth quarter, and we'll take our swings and we'll take our haymakers then. I, I do not mind it whatsoever. I'm in the minority. I know it. But guess what? You know, it, it's it's okay. It's okay. It's an okay game plan. It just didn't work out tonight. Because on the other side, regardless what you did, you were going to lose. So it is what it is. But how it all played out, they had a 9-0 lead. The Bills started out 9-0 lead. Kicked the field goal, and then they had a muffed pump by Hardman, which got the Bills to the 1, to the 2-yard line in that area. They were able to punch it in with ease pretty much right from there on one play. So, missed the extra point too. Hardman pissed off, goes to the sideline, throws his jacket over his head. And in, in the back of my brain, I was thinking, huh, all right, how is this kid going to respond? Because you know about his speed. You know about his playmaking ability. This kid is important. I mean, he's very valued to this squad. And I know Travis Kelsey is and Tyree Kill is to another level. Hardman is very important. And what do they do? Well, here's an end around. Well, here's a play for you. Go back to the kid. Go back to him. Get his confidence back. Get him involved. Here he is on a beautiful end around, which ends up scoring a nice play. Like, 
or excuse me, it led to a big gain, I should say. Huge play. But when you see someone react that way on the sideline, guys coming up, tapping them on the head, dapping them up, saying, you're good, you're good, we need you. I always like to see, how does the individual respond? How will he play after that? Is it going to be a game where he continues to put his head on the sideline and you can see him pout and you can see him unhappy after certain plays on the field? Or is he going to wake up, just rub it off, shake it off, and continue to go out there and battle like you do all season long? And I thought that he responded to the hard time, right? He faced some adversity. Brutal play. You talk about in an AFC championship game at home early on, you're muffing a punt, punt and allowing the Bills to score, and, and you now are down 9 nothing. One of the reasons why I thought he needed to react differently there is so much game left, and your quarterback is Pat Mahomes, and your head coach is Andy Reid. It would be a different scenario if you're the Browns. And you go down 9 nothing early, and this is no shot at the Browns, but I'm just saying, if I didn't have Pat Mahomes and I didn't have Andy Reid, would I feel different in that moment? And would I feel like, hey, you know, a little bit more down on myself if I was in that spot? Yes. But if I'm, if I'm in that spot knowing who my team is, knowing how many times we came back last year in the playoffs, knowing the circumstances, I'm shaking my head right from the top going, my bad, my bad, my bad. Here we go, Patty. Get my back. Support me. Because I know you will. And what do you know? Within a little bit of time, the powerhouse that they are, drive downfield, score at will, unreal. I thought two great games, though. Fantastic games. Very entertaining, high quality, super fun. And now you have Tom Brady versus Pat Mahomes in the Super Bowl. Is that not incredible? Is that not perfect? You talk about an awesome scenario. You talk about a, a great storyline for the next two weeks leading up to this thing. There's going to be a lot of drama involved. This is it. Andy Reid can go back to back. This guy has been a magician out in Kansas City. He can win back to back Super Bowls, but he's got to go up against Tom Brady, the guy who he lost to when he was in the Super Bowl with the Philadelphia Eagles. Can he get revenge? And the real question is, who are you pulling for here in Philly? I know majority will probably say Andy Reid, and as much as I was pouring for Andy Reid last year, and I really was, and I think I was even criticizing the people who weren't, as if why wouldn't you be cheering for Andy Reid last season? Well, this season, I don't know. I feel a little different about it. It's almost like I kind of want Tom Brady to win. It's too early. You know, this is a very emotional time and how I'm feeling. It's the it's literally moments right after all this happened. There's a two-week window for me to change my opinion. But right now, I kind of want to see Tom Brady do it again at his age and continue to do it. It wasn't pretty for him, but guess what? He just continues to find ways. Continues to find ways. It got ugly at the end of that Bills game, by the way. Bills frustrated, hit some guys late, although Josh Allen is on on his back chucking footballs at people's heads, and that somewhat started the tussle. And you know, It, it got a, a little overblown. You don't want to lose sight on what a great season was because of you know immature stuff afterwards. You got to tip your caps to their season because it, it was impressive. The last thing I'll say here is on the game, Tony Romo, what happened? Because there were moments where he was strong. He was awesome. We were just foaming out the mouth with excitement because every time Tony Romo would say something, it would happen. It was great. Did he fall off a cliff or what? I mean, he's almost unlistenable now. What the hell happened to him? I think he's been garbage. He went from elite to garbage. How did that happen so quickly? I don't know. This matchup, though, this Super Bowl matchup is going to come down to one thing. As you see here, I'm rocking a nice metal vent from Lululemon. This is an older one. I've been through the trenches with this bad boy. I've been through war. All right, been through a lot of workouts, tough workouts, pouring sweat. Luckily, outstanding metal vent. It gives you that, that space to breathe. Whichever one of these quarterbacks go out and they start warming up on the sideline. I'm talking on Super Bowl day. You know how you can see the pre-live, the pre-game footage, live footage of them on the football field warming up. The game's in Tampa Bay. 
Whichever one of those quarterbacks put on their Lululemon, whether it's the dry sense hoodie, whether it's the metal vent long sleeve, or the metal vent tee, whatever it is, whoever puts that on to warm up and you get that action shot where you see the logo on the side, back left, okay, they're going to win that football game because it's all about how you feel. Look good, feel good, play good. And trust me, there's nothing better than putting on a nice, fresh Lululemon tee or long sleeve or dry sensed hoodie. So I'm just saying, Tom, if you're listening, Pat Mahomes, if you're listening, hell, Andy Reid would look good in some Lulu. Oh, we can get Andy Reid in some Lulu. Whoever decides to rock it, it's an automatic victory. Just saying. Before I let you go, Do not forget about my friends over at Orbit Energy and Power. With over 20 years of experience in the industry, Orbit Energy and Power is home to your solar experts in both residential and commercial projects. Their solar program helps eliminate your electric bill completely. They offer flexible financing solutions such as $0 down. They also provide water purification systems, backup energy services, battery storage, and more. So check out all their information down below. Thank you guys so much for listening, and I will see you next time.